the the key fact in this case is whether or not Mr. Hodgson saw the fight took place, because the uh, complaints allege that he stated he didn't see didn't see the fight took place, and the complaints are stating that he lied when he said that. His state, but uh, Mr. Hodgson's statements have never changed. He's always uh, said the same thing. He didn't see the fight. Uh, Officer Nato, we did hear Officer Nato say that um, Mr. Hodgson said he didn't know there was a fight. Officer Kelly contradicted that and said that. Uh, he did know there was a fight, he just didn't see it. So there's contradictions with the police testimony, but Mr. Hodgson has never contradicted himself. He didn't see the fight. We just heard from Mr. Fiascanero that uh, George did not come out until the fight was completely over, which would mean, once again, he didn't see the fight. Um, Mr. Hodgson is uh, crippled. He walks very slowly, so it takes him a long time to get from A to B. He was behind the bar at the time that this happened, and it took him a while to get outside to see what was going on. Therefore, when the police asked him about what happened, he was he, he stated the truth that he didn't see it. Um, there is no crime in that. Um, I also there's also uh, I have some issues with the way the complaints are worded. Uh, you have uh, the court has on file a, a motion that I made to dismiss a duplicative complaint, yeah. and uh, there's also the fact that. The, the statute under which Mr. Hodgson is charged under, this allows someone harboring or concealing, those are harboring or concealing quotes, a person. Harboring or concealing a person. Uh, the words clearly together, harboring and concealing, talk about hiding a person, you know, putting them in a room, keeping them from being able to be found. Mm -hmm. The complaints charge that Mr. Hodgson concealed not a person, but an identity. Therefore, they don't allege a crime at all. Um, Furthermore, hindering is a specific intent crime. Uh, there's not been a shred of evidence that uh, Mr. Hodgson's intent was to hinder an apprehension. Um, and lastly, uh, the complaints dealt with particularity requirement. Uh, they don't allege any particular conduct. They simply state a uh, conclusion, uh, conclusionary statement that he concealed the identities of other people. Um, those are regarding hindering apprehension. Regarding the unsworn falsification, um, I would note that the complaint was an alleged crime as RSA 641.3 requires the statement to be made on a form, and the complaint says that uh, it was made only from Harlow. Um, in addition, the fact that the the um, the key fact at issue here, if he didn't see the fight, he didn't make a false statement. That's all I have now. Um, I don't believe that there's any case on point that dismiss a complaint for a typographical error and you want to give us from, from and form this uh, typographical error. It's clear from the reading of the complaint what that uh, complaint meant. Uh, so I, I, that argument I, I think fits in terms of whether it's from or form. Uh, in terms of the wordings of the complaint, uh, Your Honor, I think they meet the test set forth by the Supreme Court that they put the defendant on notice. Um, there are two separate hindering complaints uh, alleging two separate uh, acts for hindering. And I think they clearly put the defendant on notice about the fact that he's, in one, he's concealing the identity of two individuals, and the other, that um, he, when he spoke to Officer Nadu, um, that he denied that he knew who committed the crime. So I think they do meet the requirements of special. Can I ask you a question? Wouldn't the state, in order for the court to make findings in those, have to prove the court beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, in fact, knew the two individuals? You literally claim that he failed to identify two individuals. What evidence do I have before the court not that indicates that this defendant knew who, even if he saw the fight? It's not that, as the, the victim indicated, John, he didn't know those individuals either, but he could describe them for the police. Um, Mr. Hodgson had a conversation with uh, the, Mr. Fiescanero that he just testified to where Mr. Fiescanero said, I'm leaving, and he told him to leave. And um, Mr. Fiescanero said, I'm out of here. So it, whether he knew their names or not. Your yes. complaint says, with the purpose to hinder the apprehension of another for the commission of crime to assault, he concealed the identity of A.L. and P.F. So assuming that A.L. or Aaron Lewis in what shred of evidence does the court have at this point in time to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, in fact, knew the identity of those two individuals? In other words, said to the police, well, one of them was Aaron Lewis and one of them was Peter 
I still have a hard time with the pronunciation, but you know who I mean. So what evidence do I have that he, in fact, knew the identity of those two people? I think identity, Your Honor, is, <clears throat> does not have to mean, just as the victim did not... What complaint says. But identity does not mean, you know, the name, date of birth, and address, necessarily. Identity means, well, the guy, there was a guy in a red shirt, it happens all the time when the police show up, that he said, I don't have any idea who committed the assault, I never saw it, I can't tell you one piece of evidence about who committed that assault. That's what he told the police. What we're saying is, in fact, he did know who committed the assault, that not specifically whether or not he knew their names, but he, that he did know, at least have some information about who committed the assault. As a matter of fact, he had a conversation with Peter Piescanero telling him to leave, which Mr. Piescanero just testified to. Um, so I believe that the identity issue, that the state has proven the identity issue, at least at this point in time, in the light most favorable to the state. And in addition to the, the other complaint, the hindering the apprehension, the same argument, Your Honor, that he knew he had some information about who had committed that assault, and he told both Officer Nato and Sergeant Kelly he had no idea who committed the assault. He hadn't even seen the fight. And he had a conversation with Mr. Piescanero as he left, telling him to leave. The conversation with that individual was to leave. Right. Because the... How am I supposed to jump from the conclusion he told that individual to leave, that he therefore saw the fight? That's a huge jump, isn't it? That's one piece of evidence, Your Honor, in the circumstantial case. You're right. I do not have an admission from the defendant saying, yes, I lied. Let me ask you a different question. If based upon the circumstantial evidence, the court can come to two conclusions, one consistent with guilt and one consistent with not guilt, which does the court have a duty to adopt? Obviously, Your Honor, of course, not guilt. But I think at this point in time, the light most favorable to the state, there is significant circumstantial evidence that the defendant committed the crime of both hindering apprehension and unsworn falsification. The evidence is Mr. Green, the victim, testified that he saw the defendant on the porch when the assault was happening, made eye contact with him, and asked him to call the police. The defendant did not do that. The defendant told the police that, well, the defendant hasn't even testified yet, Your Honor, but the statements from the two officers are that the defendant told them he had no idea who committed the assault, he hadn't seen any of it, and that the reason he didn't call the police is because he didn't have time or he thought somebody else had one. We have the victim's testimony that he affirmatively asked him to call the police and he refused to do so, that he looked at the defendant in the eye and asked him for help, that the defendant stood there and watched that assault happen. So whether or not the defendant absolutely knew the name, the date of birth, the place of residence of the individuals committing the assault, he certainly could have given a description to the police about what they looked like and how the assault had happened based on the testimony of the victim. And we don't have any contrary evidence to that, Your Honor. We have the officer's testimony and their testimony is they didn't believe him when he was saying, and that's what the complaints are about, they didn't believe him when he was saying, I didn't see any part of the fight. The only testimony we have is from Mr. Green who says, yes, he did see the fight and he refused to call the police. I'll take your motion to dismiss for various reasons, such as duplicity and your advisement. Considering the evidence in the light most favorable to the state of the court, you must do a disjunction of your motion to dismiss as denied. Your Honor, do you wish to present evidence? I do. Call your first witness, please. Call your first witness, please. Yes. I would like to first call Sergeant Peterson. Sergeant Peterson, sir. Sergeant Peterson, sir. Okay. Sergeant Peterson, here. Your Honor, I have a, the court actually has on record. All right. I'm going to give a little bit of background here, Your Honor. I am referring to the letter that you sent to the prosecutor. Yes, but there was some background before that. As copied in the letter that I sent to the prosecutor is an attorney from, I'm sorry, an email from Attorney Bonham that stated Friday, November 19th, State's Attorney Hipple, this letter is to confirm that the state will have the following officers at court and state the Hodgson matter in lieu of a subpoena from the defendant. First of all, this is Sergeant Peterson. In early November, I had spoken to Attorney Bonham and asked her, well, first of all, said that I wanted to cross-examine Sergeant, or examine Sergeant Peterson. She said she didn't think it was relevant. I explained why I thought it was relevant and said that I was going to be issuing subpoenas for Sergeant Peterson and the other officers. 
she stated that she would make him available to me. And I said, well, I think I'm still going to do a subpoena just to be safe. She said uh, that she was offended, that I did not trust her word as an officer of the court, that she would make Sergeant Peterson available to me without a subpoena. And I said, well, I would leave, I, I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I then spoke to um, uh, Attorney Bauman and I believe to Chief Began, and I stated that I wanted them, I asked that they would accept service of a subpoena uh, rather than me having to hunt down the officers while they were on patrol if I could serve it on the front desk and they would then bring it to the officers. I was told both by Chief Began and by Attorney Bauman that they would not uh, accept service of the subpoena because the Attorney Bauman had already promised me that they would be made available, therefore the subpoenas were not necessary, they would not accept service. So I then asked Attorney Bauman to at least put it to me in writing. She sent me an email which is copied in this letter that the court gave that she would make them available, as she said, in lieu of a subpoena. In order to be absolutely sure, I did send, I, I sent a letter to Attorney Bauman, copied with the court, uh, say, saying that if she no longer was able to make them available, she needed to tell me. Um, and just basically, I wanted it on the record twice that uh, these, these witnesses, she had told me that this witness would be available to me. Uh, for some reason, he was never here. I have no idea how that comports with her promises as an, as an officer of the court, in her words, and uh, her uh, basically telling me not to get a subpoena, that they would cooperate with a subpoena, and that it wasn't necessary. Uh, I would like to ask to move this move to dismiss this case based on prosecutorial prosecution misconduct. Your Honor, back in November, that it was a little yeah. less than that. Yeah. 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 Uh, asking me if Sergeant, if I was going to have the officers here in lieu of the subpoena. To be honest with you, I'd forgotten about Sergeant Peterson and the whole thing from before. I did call him and leave him a message yesterday <coughs> saying, uh, I don't plan on calling Sergeant Peterson. He is not going to. The, the I'm, sorry, I'm, about, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Can I, can I just say that? I'm sorry to interrupt. That message did not say that, and I can play the message for the court. It did not say I do not plan on calling Sergeant Peterson. I have the message. I can play it for the court right now. I said Sergeant Peterson was not going to be here. I said, I, said I'm not. Said. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, I am going through my witnesses. I'm not exactly sure who I'm going to call, which was true. I said, I'm going through them tonight. But by implication, right. like Sergeant Peterson, can I finish, please? Sergeant Peterson may or may not be there tomorrow. That was my point. Um, can I ask you a question? Did you tell Attorney Hippel there was no need to subpoena him? In November, I did. I honestly forgot about that. So when I got his letter on Friday, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, but I honestly forgot that that had happened. That was in November, when it was months ago. So when this trial came up, so you did, you did tell me back in November that because he had previously scheduled court. He didn't. I was not going to call him for this case, but I said I'll tell you what. He's got court anyway. You don't need to subpoena him. He'll be there anyway. That did happen. Based upon that promise, it sounds like he didn't subpoena him. He didn't. Based but that upon was the promise that he received. What if it was in November or yesterday? Can he? Abide by the fact you made a promise to him that the sergeant would meet you? Again, Your Honor, because it was so many months ago, I forgot that that had happened until I got his letter on Friday. Where is Sergeant Peterson as, we, as, we say, as I sit here? I don't know that, Your Honor. Well, ask one of the officers to reach out to whoever you would ask, reach out to, and find out where he is and if there's any possibility of what he can do. Yes, Your Honor. I believe Bob Stamont is just going to do that right now. Your Honor, I'd also like to know just um, that we asked to have the witnesses sequestered. Actually, my pleasure's on my witness list. He shouldn't he's be not, here. He's not he testifying. Now. He's on my witness list. He's happy. So he oh, should have been in here when Mr. Tassigaro was testifying. We are here at the witnesses sequestered. Can we have a sequestered term? Yes, Your Honor. I made it clear all witnesses are sequestered and are supposed to be informed not to talk about the testimony. If witness sitting in the court listening to testimony does not comply with the sequestration. I, Forgot that he had put him on his witness list. I was not going to call him. So Brandon said, "Officer oh, Montplaisir said, can I come to the courtroom?" And I said, "In order to move this around, along, I don't know what's going to. Sergeant Peterson can be here, so you can call him in your case. It might be a more point. So why don't you call your next witness? And I'll deal with the issue of Sergeant Peterson. In fact, still. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I will call um, Mark Montplaisir, please. Is there making a phone call? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. That, Your Honor, there's, uh, there's, there's three witnesses with the last name on pleasure. There is no relation to the office of Brandon Montplaisir. All right. Do you have that witness in the court? Uh, they are uh, out in that room. Should I get them or should they? It doesn't matter as long as somebody gets them. Um,
nobody's moving. M-O-N-T-P-L-A-I-S-I-R. <coughs> and were you present at Palmer's Tavern on April 30th into the morning of um, um, May 1st, 2010? I was. And uh, are you aware of a fight that took place at that bar on April 30th, the night of April 30th? Yes. Where were you when this fight took place? In the bar. You were in the bar. What portion of the bar were you? Uh, at the bar, I left that. <coughs> I'm oh, sorry, you were sitting at the, at the actual bar? Yes. Okay, and um, when did you become aware that a fight had taken place or was taking place? Uh, once overheard there was a fight outside. You were, so you, someone came in and said there's a fight outside? Yes. Okay, and at that point, what did you do? Went outside. You went outside and you watched? You watched. What, no, what, I didn't see what was going on. There was, I didn't actually but, see a fight. When, by the time you got outside, was there still a fight in progress? No. So by the time that someone said there's a fight, and it took you how long to get to the door? With the 40, 50 people in there, a couple minutes. Two, three minutes, you think? Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. So it took you two minutes to get to the door by that time the fight was over, I guess. And it took you two minutes to get to the door. Do you have any kind of handicap or uh, any kind of <coughs> prevention from walking? Do I? Pers yes, personally, as a normal person. It took you two minutes. Uh, did you see Mr. Hobson at any point in time during this afternoon? Behind the bar. So he was behind the bar. When you were, you were sitting at the bar and Mr. Hobson was behind the bar? Yeah, he was. I believe he's doing this. I don't know what he's doing. Behind the bar. Okay. And when someone came in and said there's a fight outside, he was behind the bar at that point. Yes. And when you made your way outside, did he did he beat you to the door? No. He did not. Why, why do you laugh? Because I can't. Um, are, are you are you referring to Mr. Hodgson's disability? Yes, sir. Um, so the so by the time you got off the I've already let me just collect my thoughts, Your Honor. Uh, could Mr. Hodgson see the fight from where he was at the bar? No. And you, how, how many how many times have you been at Palmer's Town? Enough. Uh, enough meeting. Over a dozen. Over a dozen times. Yeah. So you're you're aware of the layout and you know what you've seen outside. So, and it's your contention that Mr. Hodgson, from where he was standing, could not see the fight. Yes. All right. Did uh, were you were you present? Uh, were you detained with the other patrons when the police showed up after the fight? Was I detained? Yeah, were you, were you kept inside the bar? Yes, yes. Yep. How long were you kept inside the bar? Three hours. Three hours. And did you hear Officer Kelly at any point say that he was going to put George out of business? Absolutely. Did you hear him say that a couple shouldn't on the bar? Thank you. Thank you. The uh, question's been answered. There is an objection. I don't want to speak until everyone wants the answer. Thank you. I'm done. Cross, please. <laughs> How much had you, had you had to drink that night? Roughly five, six beers. Okay. And uh, so as you're running out to see the fight, you're keeping track of what the defendant was doing. Well, we keeping track of anything. Right. And before the fight started, you were keeping specific track of what the defendant was doing. No. Okay. And do you have any idea how long it was before somebody hollered fight that the fight had been going on? No idea. Honey, I'd ask this witness to be Excuse. Any objection? Thank you. No. 
But Mr. President, you can lead any time you need. You can lead the court. You're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Can you also stay in the courtroom if you wishes? No. No, we can't. Same word. Okay. So, Mark, could you please hit? Um, could you please hit Billy? Billy. Your Honor, I'm going to call Billy. My pleasure, Max. Is it Billy or is it Billy? I'm sorry. Is it Billy or is it Billy? I I, I will uh, check with the witness. Okay. The same no spelling. No. I'm sorry. Same spelling. Same spelling as his brother. Stand up next to that chair. Look on this way, you know. Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Have a seat, folks. Can you state your full formal name and spell your last name for the court? William Robert Montplaisir, M O N T P L A I S I R. Okay. And were you present at Palmer's Tavern on April 30th into the morning of May 1st, 2010? Yes, I was. And um, what? Where were you? Uh, did, are you aware that there was a fight that occurred on the evening of May, uh, April 30th? I am. And uh, where were you when this fight took place? In the bar. In the bar. What portion of the bar? By the pool table. By the pool table. How far is the pool table from the actual bar area? Uh, I'd say about 20 feet. How many paces? Mm -hmm. How many steps to get from the pool table to the bar? 10. Maybe. 10 paces? Mm -hmm. You have a clear view of the bar from? Yes. Okay. What point did you find out that there was a fight going on outside? Uh, when someone yelled, there's a fight going on outside. Okay, so you weren't aware of the fight before someone came in and said that there was a fight? Yes, sir. And what did you do after you heard that there was a fight going on? Uh, I followed everyone else, right outside. And how long did it take you to get outside? A couple minutes. You said two minutes? Yes, sir. About that. Oh, about two minutes. About two minutes. Um, once you got outside, what was happening? Nothing. Nothing? The fight was over? It was over. And um, did, before you went outside, did you happen to see uh, George Hodgson? No, I did not. You did Did you see him before? You, you didn't see him when you were inside? No, I did not see him inside nor outside. You didn't see, you didn't see him outside either? No. Okay. Um, the fight uh, lasted, <coughs> do you have any idea how long the fight lasted? From the point when I heard there was a fight to the point I went outside, a couple minutes maybe. Okay. Uh, were, you, uh, were you detained um, for, with the uh, other patrons after the fight? Certainly was. How long were you detained for? Uh, I'd say about three hours. Three, and a half, three hours? Uh, were you questioned at all? Was I questioned personally? No. Did you hear, um, did you ever at any point hear Sergeant Kelly state that he was going to put Palmer's tavern out of business? Rejecting the honors of the evening. Sustained. Thank you. That's all I have. So, how far is it from the pool table to the door outside? About the same as it is to the bar. So, 20 bases. Yeah, about okay. 10, 15 cases. Right? So 10 or 15 cases, yeah. so I'm going to step the back of them. And I'll do bigger steps. About that far? And it took you two minutes to go from there to there? Yeah, it says I. Two minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, two o'clock, you can do the second hand. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi, eleven Mississippi, twelve Mississippi, thirteen Mississippi, fourteen Mississippi, fifteen Mississippi, sixteen Mississippi, seventeen Mississippi, eighteen Mississippi, nineteen Mississippi, twenty Mississippi. 21 Mississippi, 22 Mississippi, 23 Mississippi, 24 Mississippi, 25 Mississippi, 26 Mississippi, 27 Mississippi. I said, I'm just going to object if we get a point. 28 Mississippi, 29 Mississippi, 30 Mississippi. That's to 30. You're taking, you're saying it took you to 30 Mississippi times three more times to get to the door. Wasn't exactly too interested in what was going on up there. It wasn't my business. So it took you two minutes. Not because it took you two minutes to get there, but because you finished your game yeah, of pool. Really right. You finished your game of pool on that one. Not because you couldn't get there. Yeah, oh. 
So the two minutes wasn't because there was a rush to the door and people were crowding away and you couldn't get there. It was just because, well, I'll finish up and then go see what's going on. Yep. Okay. I'm not saying I don't want to help, but that's so fine. That's what it took me. Okay. So let's just tell how it took you. Other people have got to have gotten there in two seconds. I'm not anyone else. Okay. And you have no idea where the defendant was when this was going on? I know he wasn't next to me in the barn. I know he wasn't outside. So he wasn't inside the bar or outside the bar? Not where I was standing. Okay. But you don't know. He could have been outside. He could have been inside. You don't have any idea. He could have been home for all I know. Right. So, yeah, as far as you know, he wasn't even at the bar that night. No, he was there. I know for a fact he was there. I thought you said he wasn't he playing pool with me. He wasn't outside. He wasn't playing pool. You know for a fact there's 50 people outside, and you know for a fact he wasn't one of them. There was nobody outside except for whatever went on out there when it happened. So when your brother testified that 50 people rushed outside, he was mistaken. I'm not saying that either. But when you got out there, no one was out there. When I got up there? Yeah. There was more than just myself out there. Everybody was out there. Not gonna go with everyone, but more than myself. How many? No, can't recall. Okay. Um, so you don't recall much that happened that night. I mean, I recall much, but not in the depth detail. Okay. And how much you had you had to drink? Yeah. Or you don't recall. It was about a year ago. I can't exactly recall. Okay, that's fair. Come on in. No question. Huh? So you say that you did not see Mr. Hodgson outside the Kibar area? I did not. Not even when I went out there. To... And if, if he was out there, do you believe you would have seen him? Oh, I know I would have seen him. Thank you. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Sure, again. You testified you didn't see the defendant inside the bar. Right. You didn't see him outside the bar. Right. But you saw him someplace on the night in question. Oh, I saw him there, yeah, but That's during what? The wind, in relationship to people going outside because somebody yelled there was a fight, when and where did you see the defendant before that incident took place? Do you yeah. understand my question? Yeah, I understand. Um, the next moment, what would you say, is when was the next time I saw him after I heard about the fight? No, before you heard about the fight. Oh, before I heard about the fight. I, I don't know, he was uh, sitting in the corner where he always was, always sits during the bar? Inside the bar? Yeah, but this is before my pool game even started. Okay. Based on that, real question? No, that's this what it is. Mr. Attorney, I'm going to go ahead you can leave, Mr. Mullins, anytime you need to, you can leave. Thank, Thank you much. How are you next to us, please? Uh, Bill, can you please get married? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. M-O-N-T-P-L-A-I-S-I-R. Okay. And were you present at Palmer's Tavern on the evening of April 30th into the morning of May 1st? Yes, I was. 2010? Yes, I was. Okay. And are you aware that there was a fight that took place on that night? We were aware of the fight. April 30th? Yes. We were aware of the fight. Um, how did you find out that the fight took place? Um, it was announced by the karaoke person that, that there, was there was a fight outside. Okay. And uh, where were you when this announcement was made? I was collecting glasses for George. He was doing dishes, and I was collecting all the dirty glasses so that he'd get wash them. Where was George doing dishes? Behind the bar. So he was, he, the was, he was doing dishes behind the bar? Behind the bar. And you, were collecting, back. you were collecting dishes from where? Uh, all, all the tables where everybody was sitting or standing, all the, all the drink glasses and stuff, because the uh, bartender didn't have any more glasses. So mm -hmm. I was collecting them for George. That's why he was back there washing glasses because there were no more glasses to distribute. So you know that he was behind the bar washing dishes because you were bringing them to him? Yes. Up to and when the announcement was made that there was a fight outside? Yep, I just handed him another um, handful of glasses and asked him if uh, he wanted me to come back there and help wash them because he, they, were, the, they were so busy. And then the karaoke woman said, there's a fight outside. Okay, and at that point, what did you do? Uh, I, I 
put the glasses down and follow like the rest of the people to go out there, but it was done. There was nothing going on. How long did it take you to get outside after you heard the announcement? I'm sorry? How long did it take you to get outside after you heard the announcement? A minute or so. About a minute. And once you got out there, the fight was over? Yes. What was, uh, when you got out there, did you, before you left, we already established where George was when you left to go outside. Where was he when you got outside? Do you have any idea? Uh, I still way behind us. There was a bunch of people. Was he so trying he, to make, I'm sorry, please, please mention. You have to understand the bar. George was down at the very end where the sinks are, which he would have had to come all the way to the other end to come back out, to come around the door to get out. So I don't recall exactly when he got out there, but I know there was a bunch of people that were in front of me and behind me. I'm not sure I understand. So would he have had to go through a back door through like the kitchen area? in order to get out from behind the bar, or No, nope. no, nope. the bar is like this, and the sink is all the way down at the end. So there's no exit down here, that's the end of the bar. So he had to walk all the way back to the other end of the bar, come out, okay. and then come out to get outside another door. Okay, so he was on one side of the bar, there's only one exit, he would have had to walk lengthwise, come out, and then walk towards the door and come out. Correct. Did you, did you ever see him make his way, make it outside? I did not, I don't recall seeing him out there. But when you made it out there, he wasn't there? No. And at that point, the fight was already over? Correct. Okay. Um, can you you say, you say that you were there helping with the dishes, so you can see when the announcement was made. I, did you look to see what you could see from the area you were standing in? Yeah, I couldn't see anything. And where, how far were you from George Hodgson at that point when you I was directly in front of him. He was in the back behind the bar. I was standing right in front of did him you, with a handful of glasses. Could you reach out and touch him if you hadn't had your hands full? Absolutely. So you could reach out and touch Mr. Hodgson and you couldn't see any, any of the fight from where you were standing? Absolutely not. The announcement was made? No. Uh, is it is it fair to say that George cannot walk fast? Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Is it fair to say that Mr. Hodgkin cannot walk fast? He cannot. And uh, why is that? Because he walks with a cane. All right. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. um, when you got outside, there was an individual standing there with blood all over him. Correct on the deck. Yes. Okay. And there were two individuals nearby him. It, it was pretty easy to tell when he got out there who'd been involved in the fight. If you want to assume, yes. Yes. So, you knew no, everyone. Excuse me, I didn't hear what you just said. I said if you wanted to assume. Assume what? Assume who was fighting. How would you assume it based on what you saw when you were out? Because there was a bunch of people just standing there saying you need to leave. And who are they telling you need to leave? Who are they telling? I don't know who was telling them. It was just people standing out there. I don't recall all the people that were out there. But who was being told to leave? Pete. And I don't know the other gentleman's name. But well, you didn't know him if you saw him. Yes. And the defendant would know them if you saw them. I don't know that. I can't answer that. You don't know if the defendant knows Peter P. Escanero? I do not know that. I don't even know the defendant. Never saw him before. You don't know George Hodgson? Oh, no, I'm sorry, defendant. I thought you were talking about the gentleman again. No, he's the defendant. The defendant knows Peter Fiescanal, right? Yes. She thought he meant... You she were... might have known him because she just saw him in the court and was introduced to him. Lay a foundation. Do, are you, do you know Peter Fiescanal? I know of him. Okay. Does he come to the bar? I've only seen him there maybe, in fact, that may be the first time I've seen him there. But it wasn't the first time you had seen him? No, like I said, I know of him. Okay. And are you aware of whether or not the defendant knows him? I am. Objection asked and answered. She has an she also would have no way of knowing. She thought I meant the victim. Does the victim not be the victim? phrased the question one last time. Are you aware of whether or not the defendant, George Hodgson, knows Peter P. Escanero? I am not. You don't know if he knows Peter P.S. Can I ask? Okay. Um, but it was clear to you coming out of there that Peter P.S. Can and another individual were being told to leave. That's what I had heard. Okay. And there was another individual standing there with blood all over him. I said, yeah, I don't know how much blood, but yes. Okay, yeah, sorry. Not blood all over him. I'll rephrase it. He had blood on him. Yes. Okay. And you were pretty certain who was involved in that altercation when you came out of the bar. I was certain who had been in a fight because right. he had been bleeding. And who had 
else had been involved in the fight based on what was happening? And just by what I had heard. Right. It wasn't hard to figure out. <coughs> just by what I had heard. I was not out there. Right. And the defendant at some point came out onto that deck. He was behind you heading out to the deck, correct? Yes. Okay. And were you present with the defendant when he was having conversations with anyone out there? Were you up with him the whole time? George? Yeah. He wasn't out there when I was out there. He came out to the deck. I, and I said I do not recall when he came out there because there was a lot of activity and a lot of people out there. So you don't know? He could have been two seconds behind you or five oh, minutes? Oh, no, he wasn't two seconds behind me. I absolutely know that. Ten seconds behind you or five minutes behind you? You don't know? I do not know. Okay. Nothing further. I have a couple questions to ask you. I take it on the night in question you were working there? No, sir, I do not. I was just a customer. You were just helping out? I was just helping out because he, George had had a new bartender that could not keep up with the activity. Nobody's asked this question, so I'll ask you if you don't mind. This deck area that I keep hearing about, that's outside of the covered portion of the bar? Yes, sir. Is it the area on the big question where people would have been seating around, seated around, seating around tables and trying to get sitting around tables being served out on the deck? Do you understand my really? question? Some I do understand that, and I, I if, you, if you remember, I, I don't recall, but it, it wasn't typical. It was where we went to smoke. So you have no recollection of whether or not people were being served out on the deck on the night? Before? No, people don't get served out there typically. They'll go out there and just smoke. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions? That's it. Further questions? No. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Uh, may the witness any objections to excuse me? Mr. Anthony, any time you need. Thank you. 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 and said there was a fight. And where were you when this announcement was made? I was standing between the pool table and the bar. Between the pool table and the bar? Where By did the you post. Do? I'm sorry? By the post. Okay. And uh, what did you do when you heard this announcement? Turned around and walked outside. So you walked outside? Yes. How long did it take you to get outside? Five seconds, seven seconds. Okay. That's probably 15 feet to the door. Okay. Um, when you got outside, after about 15 second walk, uh, what was going on? Uh, nothing. Everything was done. Fight was over, but I mean, so someone made the announcement. You walked out in 15 seconds. It was already over. Already over. Okay. And were you aware of where Mr. Hodgson was before the uh, announcement was made that there was a fight? Behind the bar. What was he doing behind the bar? Washing dishes. Okay. And after, and when he was washing dishes behind the bar, do you know? Did you happen to see if he started walking towards the door after the announcement was made? I did not. You didn't see. And how long did you stay outside after you uh, got out there for the fight? 30 seconds, maybe a minute, if that. Okay. In that minute of time, did you see Mr. Hodgson come outside onto the deck area? No, nope. I actually met George walking back in the door. Okay, so you, just to make sure I understand, you walked out, took 15 seconds to walk out, the fight was over. Yep. You stayed up there for about a minute. Yep. You walked back in. Yep. And Mr. Hodgson had still not made his way, not, had not made it. He was at the door. I don't know if he had come out the door and come back in, but he was at the door when I walked back in. So the fight was absolutely, you're, you're absolutely certain that the fight was over by the time Mr. Hodgson got outside. Uh, the fight was over by the time I got outside, so yeah. And you were standing, you said, between the bar and the pool table. Did Correct. you see the fight from where you were standing? Oh. Do you have any uh, independent recollection of your own? Have you ever stood in the area where Mr. Hodgson was standing? And do you know whether you can see the, the uh, deck area from that point? I've never stood back there because that's the bar. Okay, fair enough. Um, 
Is it fair to say that Mr. Hodge can't walk fast? Yes. Why is that? He walks with a cane. Okay. And uh, just to wrap up, can Mr. Hodge? I'm sorry. I thought I heard something. Uh, just to wrap up, can Mr. Hodge see the fight from? Um, you know, what? I'm going to withdraw the question. I have no further questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Good. Um, so someone came inside and said there was a fight. Yes. So it wasn't. I made an announcement like over a microphone. No. Okay. So it wasn't the karaoke person interrupting. Okay. Um, and you went outside right away after you heard the word fight. I didn't rush to it. I'm sorry, but you sort of turned and made your way out. Turned my way out. Few seconds. Um, were you concerned at that point in time with whether or not the defendant, Mr. Hodgen, was going to go out to the fight or not? No. Okay. And as you said, he could have gone out and come back in for all you know when you met him in the door. Sorry, you didn't say that. Objection. You, that's what, I believe you testified on direct that you met him in the doorway. I met him in the doorway. And I don't know if he ever came outside right. or came back in, but right. I would find it very unlikely that George beat me back to the door. Because okay. the bar has to go all the way around and all the way back to the front door. But if you were out there a minute. If I'm out there a minute, he could have, okay. theoretically, yeah. And again, that wasn't your wasn't concern. My concern. Right. Uh, now, when you went out there, there was somebody standing there bleeding. He was walking back towards the bar at that point. Okay. But you saw someone, uh, okay, not standing necessarily, but there was an individual outside bleeding. Yes. Okay. And he wasn't standing, he was walking right. towards the bar. Okay. He was and outside. He was walking right? into the bar. Okay. And do you have any idea once he came, you know, I know you don't know where he went. He's heading into the bar. Do you have any idea, any conversation he may have had with the defendant, George Hodgson? Uh, when he was walking back in, he was on his cell phone. And I believe at that point, George had the phone in his hand and offered to call. And he said, I'm already on the phone with 911. At which point my sister said, hey, okay, you're okay. Okay. You can't testify to what your sister said. Okay. Well, if I if testify to what George said, why can't I? But that one thing is not the question before you. My question was, did the defendant, did you overhear a conversation, or all of the conversations? I you? only overheard him asking if he needed the phone. Okay. Other than that, you don't know what conversation transpired. Okay. And when you went outside, did you overhear people telling people to leave? No, ma'am. You, you did not overhear that? Okay. So that didn't happen in your presence? Not in my, no, I was a witness, no. Okay. I have nothing further to do. I have a few more questions, John. So you say that so the person was walking back, he had blood on him. Was that, is that, do you know who Mr. Green is? Do you recognize him? Just from that night. You know, and was it Mr. Green that was walking back with blood on him? Yes. Did you see anybody else? I saw a lot of people I don't. That, that had blood on him or that you thought no. about? No. So the only person that you saw that you thought that had an indication they could be involved in the fight was Mr. Green? Yes. You didn't see anybody else? And when Mr. Green was walking back, he was walking back from where? Uh, he was walking back from the parking lot. So he was, how many paces from you was he at that point? I don't know, he's walking towards the door, so maybe 10 paces from the door, I guess. There was cars there, so he was walking around the cars. So, so he was, so the fight, well. I don't know where the fight was. Okay, yeah. I didn't see um, it. And you're stating that he was already on the phone with 911 before he even entered the bar? That's what he said. So there was, okay. Uh, no further questions? Um, what is the most useful? Any objections, Mr. Ebron? No. Sir? Um, you're free to leave anytime you want. Thank you. Mr. Carlos, could you ask uh, Joshua Solomon to please come up? Definitely. Uh, Joshua Solomon. Uh, Solomon, S A L O M O L, I believe. Thank you. Solomon, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. 
And were you present at Palmer's Tavern on the evening of I mean, uh, April 30th, 2010, into the morning of May 1st, 2010? Yes. And um, are you aware that there was a fight that took place on the evening of April 30th, 2010, in that bar, or around that bar? Yes. How did you find out that this fight took place? Um, well, I heard a bang. I was sitting at the bar. You were sitting at the bar? I was sitting at the bar. Okay. Um, and I heard a bang, and I turned and I saw, I turned to my left, and I saw uh, one of the white plastic chairs on the porch fall over next to the window. Okay. And where you were sitting, where, well, let me ask you this. The bar is, how many, do you know how many chairs approximately, or how long this bar is? Uh, I don't know. I'd say there's 10 or 15 okay. seats along the bar. And do you know, when you were sitting at the bar, do you have any recollection of where Mr. Hodgson was? Really? He was face to face with me. He was on the other side of the bar, he was washing dishes. I was, I mean, we were literally okay. two feet from each other. Okay. He was standing there leaning on the sink with one hand and using the other hand to wash dishes. Okay. And uh, when you heard the standing, what did you do? Uh, I immediately stood up and walked out the side door that's over there in the uh, the main area by the pool table. Okay. And I stepped out onto the porch and the fallen chair was right there in front of me. And why did you feel like it was necessary to go and check out the fallen chair? I mean, curiosity. I mean, there was noise going on outside. But was, it was, was obvious. Raised voices or something Yeah, else? raised voices. There was yelling. I couldn't make anything out. But my, when something falls over, obviously something's taking place. Okay. And when you made your way outside, was that, did, are you aware that there was a, any, are you aware if there was an announcement made that said there's a fight outside? I, I don't recall. If, don't recall. If, I, I don't recall anything like that. If it, if it did take place, it was after I had moved outside. Okay. And did you see a fight when you got outside? Uh, I saw shadows. I mean, I heard what sounded like a fight. Uh, what it had done is the fight had moved from that area, that end of the building. It had moved uh, to the other end of the parking lot. Okay. Uh, so when I got out there, all that was there was things that were knocked down and things had moved, you know, whatever was going on had moved to the other end of the parking lot towards, uh, towards my vehicle. And that concerned me. I didn't want anybody, you know, fighting up against my vehicle. So I began to walk down there. As I moved that way down the parking lot, uh, things broke up. I mean, it had split up. and. Uh, uh, the, there was one fellow walking back along the porch. Mm -hmm. He had gone back, he had, he had circled back up to the porch on that other end of the building mm -hmm. where the pizza joint is and was walking back towards the other end that he was on the phone. Do you know who that gentleman was? I believe it was John Green. I did not know him at the time. Okay. Um, I did not recognize him. Do you rec would you recognize him if you yes. saw him today? Was it that gentleman sitting in the back in the no, white t-shirt? Okay. Um, okay, you said he was on the phone. Did you hear anything he said? Yeah, he was uh, He was yelling, I'm a sweat. I don't think it's hard for the truth that you didn't have a sweat. Oh, wow. Go ahead. You can answer the question. Yeah, I know exactly what I heard him screaming. I, I don't know what he was saying on the phone. Okay. But what he was screaming to the crowd, or screaming, yelling, I don't know, what he was yelling to the crowd was, I'm a selectman and I'm going to have this bar shut down. Or objection. Again, and it has to be stricken. It's not relevant. Mm -hmm. Objection to the rule. Did you see anybody else that seemed to be involved in the fight? Uh, no, I mean, I saw some gentlemen that were talking, but I didn't recognize who they were. Again, that, that took place on the other side of the bar. And did you at any point make your way back to the bar? Uh, I did, but uh, I went through the, uh, the center door this time because I had moved that direction down the bar, and I had gone through the center door. Okay. Um. And when you when you uh, went back into the bar, about how many minutes had you been outside? I had only been outside for uh, one or two minutes, not very long at all. No, I mean, it was I had been out there long enough to to see that whatever had happened had 
ended and that folks were were trying to to settle it down and deal with it. And had Mr. Hodgson made his way out made it outside by the time you walked back inside? He had. As I was walking back in, it was before I made it back to the porch area where I had to step up onto the porch. He had come out and uh, he had made it there. But by that time, again, it was over and, and the, the one fellow was back on the porch walking back down towards the other end. Did you actually see Mr. Hodgson walk through the doors to come outside? I don't. Uh, again, I had been paying attention to the commotion that was at that end of the parking lot mm -hmm. and uh, basically ensuring that it wasn't taking place near my vehicle or watching that it wasn't taking place near my vehicle. Crazy. And, and oh, I'm sorry. As, oh. I'm just saying, I, just, I, had, I had been standing there about midway down the building and as I turned, uh, Mr. Hodgson was standing on my left at that point. Is it fair to say that Mr. Hodgson can't walk with them? I would say so. No, Why is that? For a while. Like his legs are stiff and he wears braces. Okay. But um, when is there any way that Mr. Hodgson could have beat you outside? To, to when you when you went outside, is there any way he could have gotten there before you? No, no. Again, he was on the other side of the bar, and I was. I mean, I was literally, you know, I don't know 10, 15 paces from the from the door. And the fight was over by the time you got out there. It was. And uh, when, from your vantage point, where you're sitting in the bar, you said you saw a chair fall over. Could you actually see any fighting going on? No, Before it was it was dark out. I mean, it was ten thirty, whatever. I mean, it was dark out. I mean, the lights. I mean, you've been inside a house. Yes. You, you can't see out windows when it's light inside and dark outside. So you never saw any of the fight. All I saw was a, again a, a white chair that fell close enough to the window that it was obvious that something had fallen over. Were you detained that night with the rest of the? Were, were, were there any patients detained that night after uh, the fight took place? Yes. Um, how long? Were you personally detained before you left? Uh, I know that I left around 2.30 a.m. 2.30 a.m. and what time did the fight take place? I'm pretty sure it happened around 10.30. I had just arrived there. I had uh, I had been there maybe 10 minutes. I was there long enough to get halfway through a, a whiskey and coke. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend and I had just left Country Spirits in Henniger. Um, and they closed at 10 and we left. Did you try to leave after, they closed. after this? Um, I, I began the process of leaving. Again, you asked me if I, I went back in the building. Uh -huh. When I went back in, that's where the register is, I immediately settled up with the bartender uh -huh. uh, simply because I knew that something had taken place and, and I wanted to be able to leave whenever I wanted to. So um, again, I settled up so that I could leave and uh, by the time that got settled up, I went to leave, and there was a state trooper at the exit that I went through. And he said? Uh, he told me to close the door and wouldn't allow anyone to leave. Three and a half hours. Uh, that's, all the, uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you uh, heard the chair fall over and heard, you said you heard the chair fall over and heard raised voices yelling? Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that point in time, the defendant was, <coughs> two, Mr. Hodgson, was two feet away from you, right across the bar from you? He was directly across the bar. And you clearly saw the chair fall over and clearly heard yelling out on the porch? Well, I don't know what clearly means. I saw okay. something white fall over. I assumed yeah. it was one of the plastic mm -hmm. chairs that's mm -hmm. on the porch, and I heard, I heard yelling, but... Uh, there was nothing clear about it. Fair enough. <coughs> uh, and so you went outside to see what was going on? I did. You said you came from Country Spirits before you went to Palmer's Tavern? What's Country Spirits? I'm not familiar with that. It's a restaurant in Hennepin. Okay. And had you had anything to drink at Country Spirits? I had one whiskey and Coke with dinner. Now, are you familiar with the defendant, George Hodgson? Did you know him before that night? Uh, I knew him as the owner in passing. I mean, we had chatted once or twice. When you had been at the bar? You had seen him there? Yeah. Outside of knowing him at the bar, do you know him outside of that? No, absolutely not. I know him pretty well. So this is the excuse, Sean?
Witness, Your Honor. Sergeant Peterson, I'm about to hand you two reports written by uh, Sergeant Joseph Kelly, one report written by Officer Brandon Montpleasure, and one report written by Officer Nato. All of you are pleased to Thank you. Let me know when you're ready. You received training as an officer with the Lake Police Department. I have. It's part of that training on the preparation of police reports. Yes. And have you been trained to prepare accurate reports? Yes. To prepare complete reports? Yes. Is one of your jobs uh, approving police reports that are written by other officers? It is. Why do you have that job? As a patrol sergeant and as a supervisor, um, sometimes but not all the time, the lieutenant will ask me to take over those duties temporarily and read reports and edit them for grammar, punctuation, spelling, and content. Okay, so you, when you say edit them for content, what do you mean? Review them for content, okay. but punctuation and, and uh, <coughs> basic editing, like Why capitalization, periods. Oh. Why is it necessary for a uh, high-ranking officer to approve police reports of low-ranking officers? A uh, system of checks and balances to make sure that the reports are as prepared as well as they can be. Okay. Now, is it important, would it be fair to say that it's important to the system, well, let me ask you this, do you, do you have a separate login under your name to log into the system to view and edit and modify and um, approve police reports? Well, I don't modify or edit the reports, Okay. but I do have the ability to log in. I kind in. of threw more questions at you than one at a time, so that's my fault. Okay. But do you have a separate login in the system? I do. And with that login, you can view police reports, yeah. you can edit police reports if you need to and you can write your own answer. Which, I, I can write my own police reports, but I don't edit other officers' reports in IMC. 
Okay. Are you capable of editing other officers' reports on IMC? Yes. Okay. Now, if anyone in your, if anyone else in the department had your login, your special login, the system for approving police reports would not work correctly, would it? In what way? Well, you tell me if this is accurate. It seems to me that if someone were, uh, if another, if a lower ranking officer had access to your login, they could approve their own police reports. If they had access to my login information? Yes, sir. Theoretically, that's true. So is it important to guard your login information from others having it? Yes. And that is something that you keep, you don't give that out to other people? I do not. Do you have your own office? I do. Do you have your own computer? I, it's the police department's computer, but okay. it, it's yeah. in my office, yes. And is it used exclusively by you? No. Okay. Who else uses your computer? Um, I, well, it's the easy way to put it is Officer Sensabella, uh, the school resource officer. Mm -hmm. And I don't, don't ask me technically how to explain it, but she has remote access to IMC and my computer, but she also has her own separate login. Okay. So we can't use the computer at the same time. So only one person can use it at the same time? Only one person can use it at a time. And only the only people who use your computer are Officer Sensabella and you? Unless I log somebody in to, or allow somebody to sit at my desk to like prepare a warrant or something Is like that. Is that a common occurrence? No. Okay. So it would it be fair to say that no one but you uses your login? It would definitely be fair to say that. Okay. Did you write Officer Mount Pleasure's report? No, I didn't. Can you please pick up Officer Mount Pleasure's report? Sure. Can you please, I'm sorry, let me know when you have it in your hands. Okay. All right, can you please look up at the top of the and see that, do you see the word enter? I do. Can you get a date and time? May 4th, uh, 2010 at 2313. And next to that is the word entry ID. What's next to that? RJP. Those, those, are, initials? those are my initials, yes. Okay, so it appears that the system would indicate that you were the one who created this report. Is that accurate? Uh, it would. Okay. Can you look at the, right under enter, the word modify? You see that? Yep. Right next to that, what's the date? It is May 5th, 20, 2010 at 0020 hours, right now. 12, 24, 20 hours. Next to that is the word modified ID. Can you think of any, the initials that are next to that word? They're my initials as well. Our okay. Uh, what are, what are, you, are you, are you familiar with Brandon Montpleasure, what his initials are? Yes, they're BFM. BFM? B Boston, F Frank. Can you please point out to me on this report where the initials BFM appear? Um, they do not. They do not appear. Okay. Um, was Officer Mount Pleasure even on duty on May 4th, 2010? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know at this point other than to... If I were to show you a patrol log, would, you be, would, that, would that refresh your recollection? It could. May I approach the literature? If you look, I'm going to turn to the page that covers May 4th, 2010. <coughs> please point out to me any time that it shows that Brandon Mont Pleasure was on duty at all that day. Please point it out to me. According to this dispatch log, he did check in for duty. Okay. Can you please take a look at May 5th? Please find if he was at all present. Yeah, I looked at that as well. You looked at May 4th and May 5th? Yes. Okay. So it appears that he was not present or on duty for the day that this report was created and the day that it was edited. Would that be fair to say? It would be fair to say that he didn't log in with dispatch. Please take a look at uh, the Officer NATO's report. Okay. See on the top left, the word enter? Yes. Okay. Um, 
That's next to that, please. May 5th of 2010. I'm sorry, May 5th? Oh, excuse me, May 1st, 2010. And underneath that is a word, uh, and, that, and that is entry, the entry ID for that is, is, is what? Whose initials appear next to entry ID for that date? Uh, NJN. And those are also made Yes. Then there's the word modify uh, underneath enter. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, what's the date next to that? June 6th of 2010. I'm sorry, are you sure it's June 6th? I'm sorry, excuse me, June 3rd, 2010. Okay. I have to read it. That's okay. Um, do you see the word modified ID next to that one? Yes. Who's the modified ID? My initials. Okay. And then underneath that, we see approved, yes? Yes. And what's the date there? June 1st, 2010. And do you see an, an approval ID? Um, that's my initials as well. So you approved this report on June 1st, 2010? According to IMC, yes. Okay, and then this report was then edited by you on June 3rd, 2010. Not edited by me, no. Okay. Is it is it is it common to uh, edit reports after they've been approved? Again, I just said to you that I didn't edit it, and I'll say that again. I did not edit it. Okay. Um, it it's a simple. It's a simple as you open the report and look at it in IMC. Mm -hmm. It's going to generate that tag. Okay. So whether whether you read it, print it. Uh, open the case to make sure there's no critical errors. Okay. Um, that's going to happen. Could you please turn to, you have two reports there by Sergeant Kelly. Yes. And if you could please find the one that is dated, there's, it's a one page, it has a signature at the bottom. Okay. You see? It's, <coughs> Yeah, one that's two pages. Yes, uh, I would like you to look first at the one that's one page with this entered font. Thank you. Yes. Do you see the word entered at the top left? Yes. What's the date then? May 1st, 2010. Actually, I just came in for Sergeant Kelly and Sergeant Peterson. The initials are not on this report, so I'm not sure how it's relevant. Your Honor, Sergeant yeah. Peterson's are, uh, initials are, are uh, present on the edited report, not the initial report that was filed. Objection on the other one. Um, I'll repeat the question, officer. Can you t tell me when this report was entered? According to AMC, it was entered May 1st, 2010. Who was the entry ID? JFK. Whose initials are those? Joe Kelly's. And that's his report, yeah. This is, this is Kelly's report, is my point? Yes. Okay. Now, you see the word modified? I do. Can you give me the date that it was modified? May 1st, 2010. So the same day. And uh, the modified ID? It's also Joe Kelly's. Uh, if you look up at the top right of the report, there's a handwritten note. Can you tell me what that report says? There's a one with a circle on it. And then there's uh, below that. There's a type page, colon one, and then below that is are my initials. And your initials? Yep. And then there's a dash, am I correct? It's a slash. A slash, okay. And then there's uh, some numbers. A uh, 203. Is that your dash number? Yes, it is. And underneath that is the words okay. Is that right? Yes, it is. Would that indicate that you approved this report? That indicated, at least for for Joe at this point, and I can't recall specifically with this report, mm -hmm. that I at least read it for him and gave it back to him saying that I thought it was good at that point. So you read and at least approved, at least on I mean, some basis, right. this report, this one page report by Officer Kelly? That's, that's what my initials would indicate. Please turn to the two page report by Officer Kelly. Okay. Do you see it? Let me make sure I've got the right one. I do. All right. Um, top left, do you see the word enter? Yes. Um, what's the date then? Uh, May 1st, 2010. And what time is that? 04.54. And if you look back at the original one-page report, is that the exact same date and time of that report? Yes. So it appears we're looking at the same report. Um, no. Well, we're looking at different iterations of the same report. Oh, right. Okay. It's and do you see, I'm sorry, same case. I don't mean to keep them with you, that's my fault. No, same case. Thank you. Underneath the word enter, do you see the word modify? Um, I do. Uh, what's the date there? It is May 4th of 2010. Okay. Do you see the word modified ID to the right of that? I do. What's the modified ID? It's my initials. Your initials? Correct. This report is, um, and 
Now, if uh, we look through this report, it's about two thirds of a page longer than the original report. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, have you had a chance to review these reports? Uh, I haven't read them in, in their entirety today. I'm just going to point out a few high points, some of the things that were changed in between May 1st and May 4th. Okay. If you look at the second paragraph, first sentence, uh, can you read that sentence out loud to me, please? Second paragraph, first Second sentence. paragraph, first sentence, right after the bolded and centered words, John Green with his date of birth. J. Period Green had blood covering his face along with a torn shirt. Comment Green advised option A to and I. I'm, so, I'm sorry, officer. Um, okay, I can mess something clear. Can you please read the one page report? Is that, oh. are, you, are you reading the one page report? No, I'm reading the two page report. Please read the one page report first. Okay. Uh, again, J. Period Green had blood covering his face. And advised option A to and I, he was the victim of an assault. Uh, please continue. Uh, J. Period Green reported that he was assaulted by an unknown male subject who had left the area in a vehicle. So it says an unknown male subject. So it would say, would it be fair to say that that in the case there's one person? Um, according to the victim at the time, yes. And it says the subject was unknown? Again, yes, it does. And it says that he left the area of the vehicle. Correct. Okay. Let's take a look at the two page report. Okay. I'm going to have you read from the first sentence of the second paragraph where you started reading in the first place. Okay, the second paragraph. Please. J. Perry Green had blood covering his face along with a torn shirt, comma, Green advised option A to, and I, he was the victim of an assault, period. Continue. I can, excuse me. I said, please continue. I contacted dispatch and requested they have rescue respond to the scene. Green reported that he was assaulted by two unknown male subjects subject while inside the bar. So this report, this edited report says that it was two unknown male subjects? Uh, it does. Okay, and it says that it was inside the bar that he was assaulted. Yes. Okay, can you please find me anywhere in the one page report that he says it was assaulted inside the bar? I'm gonna object, John. This is not like Sergeant Peterson's report. I mean I like Well apparently it is Sergeant Peterson's report. No, like I stated earlier, all that all that tag is it indicates that I read the report or opened the case number to look for errors or possibly review the photos, but it certainly doesn't indicate that it's my report. Question. Yes, Your Honor. What's the difference? You use the term modify as opposed to edit. What's the significance? Or what's the difference between when they're on the report it says edit or modify? Do I don't, you understand my question? I, I believe so, Your Honor. Um, I don't modify. The, the You've also said you don't edit. That's why I'm trying to clarify right. the difference. In, in IMC, I don't modify anything. And I guess it's how you want to use the, the definition of the word. What happens is I get a, a printed copy of the report, typically. And I read it and I look for, um, like I said, am instead of and. I look for that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, when I say edit it, I mean... I make corrections, um, much like a teacher would for a student for an English paper. And I look for um, lack of punctuation or too much punctuation or misspelled words or capitalization issues. And then if I'm familiar with the case, I also look for um, content regarding the, you know, probable cause for the arrest or, uh, you know, each, each case is different, but I look for... So if, if you, as the approving supervisor, have a problem with the content in the report, in other words, you think the factually it's not complete enough, what do you do with the report? I send it back to the, the arresting officer or the investigating officer with notes, uh, in the margin notes, saying this, is, this needs to be reviewed, this is incomplete, or what are you, what are you trying to say here, um, along with a variety of, of uh, like I said, spelling punctuation errors and stuff like that. And then once that gets to the officer who wrote the report, what happens then? They go back and make the corrections, and typically it'll make it back to that police officer once, they'll make the necessary corrections, it'll come back, it'll either be read by me, but sometimes, and that's why I said there's no absolutes with this, Sometimes I may read the report the first time, and it will get sent back you, to a different supervisor. You have two different reports, correct, in front of you? Right. right. It would appear that a change has been made because in one it says that Mr. Green was assaulted by one person. Right. In the second it says two people inside the box. And I can only assume that when... Uh, Do you know who made those changes? Sergeant Kelly. 
the person that repealed it. Correct. Do you know why he made those changes? I do not. Go ahead. Uh, in the first report, we covered it. It said that the subject was the suspects were unknown. Is that correct? We covered that. Correct. And the second report, the two-page report. Um, can we look at the bottom third of the second full paragraph? It looks like they have the name Aaron, and they also have the name Peter for these supposedly unknown people. This is not Sergeant Peterson's report. He testified as not his report. He testified that he doesn't. He didn't modify Sergeant Dennis' report, but he didn't make those changes. So I'm not sure where we're going with this. I don't need it. He hasn't asked a question yet. Well, he's asking to. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, could you please find the, in, in the report, the name, in the, uh, the two page report, bottom half of the second paragraph? Um, can you find a place where the suspects identify themselves or identify the report? And two page report, please. Okay, we'll be back on this. Okay, here's your go. Objection, objection, this is my, this is my objection. Where are you going with this? Um, I am going with I understand that changes have been made in reports, but it doesn't sound, based upon the heard, that he made the changes. Wouldn't these, well, wouldn't these questions you proposed to the person who prepared the report? I am proposing them to the person who prepared the report, Your Honor. I'm sorry? Um, I am proposing them to the person who prepared the report, Your Honor. I mean, we, we covered Officer Montplaisir's uh, report. His report was created when he was not on duty. His report was then edited. He was more modified. It was when it was appeared he wasn't on duty, based upon what was testified about the police law. Yes. And then we have we have the Officer Nato's report that was actually signed off on and then edited um, later on. And this is the only report where the state apparently made a mistake and they accidentally sent me two copies of the same report. Um, and in it, you can see that the, state, it, the first one is only modified by Officer Kelly, and the second one is modified by Officer Peterson. And there are significant Sergeant factual, I'm sorry, thank you, Sergeant Peterson. There are significant factual changes. But hasn't he testified that he didn't make the changes that would have been sent back to the officer that wrote the report to make the changes? I'm not back? surprised that he testified that he didn't make the changes, Your Honor. I'm simply proving that he did. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to figure out how you're proving that he did. He's testifying that he did. Okay. You're trying to lay the groundwork to prove that he did. Well, I'm, I'm going off of uh, the fact, I'm going off of, first of all, the, the evidence related to Officer Mark Pleasure's report, the Officer uh, Officer NATO's report, and then what, what I consider to be the two most, um, the two most, uh, the two biggest facts in this case, and, and this, for this issue, is first of all, my Pleasure was not on duty either time that his report was either created or edited. And then you have the, uh, this report being edited to the point where it's substantially different. Now, there, there are alibis for both, but I'm, I'm going to submit to the court that given the totality of the circumstances, those alibis don't hold up. It's just there's too much. There's, I'm, I'm basically saying that these police reports, uh, there's a lot of doubt that I think can be cast in these police reports, and I'm basically impeaching the officer's testimony and saying that it's not worthwhile or believable or credible testimony. Um, I'm happy to, uh, I think that I did, I did cover the changes that were made to the report with Officer Kelly, and I can, uh, I think in just the, in the purposes of the court's time, I, I won't go over them again with Officer Peterson. Um, and I think that that would probably be all I have. Uh, let me just, let me just shut you up. That's all I have. Again, Sergeant Peterson. In IMC, when you view a report, anytime you review a report, for whatever reason, if I open that report to print it, what does IMC report at the top of the page? It'll report that it's modified by the person that opens that report. Whether you make a change of a period, no change, or change the entire report, if you open that report, IMC will show that it was modified. Correct. On that day. And again, as a supervisor, <coughs> when you make corrections to an officer's report, do you do that in IMC, on their report itself in IMC? I do not. What do they provide you with to have you make those corrections? A hard printed copy that I make um, handwritten, handwritten recommendations and corrections to. And if 
for whatever reason, an officer does not call in to dispatch, does not 10 1 with dispatch, will they show up on the dispatch log? They will not. I'm sorry. What does 10 1 mean? 10 1 means in service. And is it routine at the Ware Police Department for officers to come in when they're not on regular duty to draft reports? It is routine, especially for the officers that live close to the police station, which was the, which was the case with this officer at one point. Um, so, even if he had not been on duty, he could have been at the police station drafting his report? Absolutely. Or speaking with the prosecutor? Absolutely. On his way to a detail? Correct. Did you draft Officer Montplager's report? I did not. Were you even at Palmer Staffing that night? I was not. So did you have any idea what happened? Only by reading the reports. So it wasn't until you read the report that you knew what happened? That's correct. It would have been difficult for you to draft a report not having been there that night. That's correct. I have nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. I am sir, these are your copies. Thank you. Yep. Uh, no, Your Honor. I am uh, not going to be calling any more witnesses. Uh, I would like to make an argument. Do you move my motion for judgment of acquittal and make the closing statement? Thank you. Go ahead, Your Honor. Okay. This time I'd like to renew my motion for judgment of acquittal. I won't re argue it in full. I will just hit the high points regarding harboring or concealing, the wording of the statute, uh, the fact that the statute disallows uh, concealing the person, whereas per, um, Mr. Hodge is charged with concealing the identity. Um, and therefore, the complaint is not alleged crime. Furthermore, uh, this is as hindering uh, apprehension or prosecution is a specific intent crime. There is no evidence of Mr. Hodge's intent that could put before this court. Lastly, the complaints fail the particularity requirement. Uh, regarding unsworn falsification, I uh, made the uh, argument based on a typographical error, um, but it did not allege a crime. I would like to, uh, I can either move on to my closing statement or I can let you make a ruling on that motion. That's up to you. We'll move on to your closing statement. Thank you. Your Honor, this case is very simple. It rests on one fact, and that is whether Mr. Hodgson was able to see a fight that took place. If Mr. Hodgson was not able to see a fight that he took the place, then he is not alive and he is not hindered at the engine of prosecution. Because every the statements that he is charged with a crime for are that he didn't see it. The state's only witness to state that Mr. Hodgson was present was John Green. John Green wrote three statements. The first statement, he didn't mention Mr. Hodgson being present. The second statement, he didn't Mr. mention Mr. Hodgson being present. The third one was six days after the event in question, when his, when his memory, I'm sure, had faded significantly. In addition, he testified that his, rip, his lip had actually been ripped. I am not sure how uh, aware of his surroundings Mr. Green is going to be when he is fighting off two assailants and uh, dealing with some significant injuries. I don't believe that he would be in front of to be able to recognize whether someone was there. Furthermore, we've heard from five, I believe five witnesses, that all testified to the exact same thing. Yes, five witnesses that all testified to the exact same thing, that Mr. Hodgson was behind the bar. Some of them testified that he was washing dishes, and about the time he got out there, the fight was over. This would, this would comport with Mr. Hodgson's statements that have never changed that he didn't see a fight. In addition, uh, the the officer's statements um, have, were uh, contradictory and not credible. Uh, Officer Nato testified at one point that he said that George told him that he quote unquote didn't even know there was a fight. Officer Kelly says that he test that Officer Kelly testified under oath, and Mr. Hodgson did say that there was a fight, but he didn't see it. So there's a there's a contradiction there. The we have significant issues that cast doubt on the police reports and the accuracy of the police reports. Um, so I think that it's it's very clear that the officer's statements are not credible. Mr. Green's statement is not only incredible given the circumstances, but he's also contradicted by five separate witnesses. Um, so there, there are three key facts, as we said. Mr. Hodgson was behind the bar, and we've, we've, had, we've had five witnesses testify to that. Um, we've had no witnesses testify otherwise. The fight started and remained outside. The only testimony that we've heard 
that the fight occurred inside. Actually, we didn't hear any testimony that the fight occurred inside. Uh, Mr. Green actually said that the fight occurred outside and remained outside. So the fight did occur outside. There is no evidence to the contrary of that. And we know that George didn't make it outside before the fight ended because, we, as, as I said, we have that from five witnesses. Furthermore, we have, I believe, at least three witnesses that all stated that they that one cannot see outside from the vantage point where Mr. Hodgson was standing. It was dark. It was dark outside and light inside, and uh, the view was blocked. We also have witnesses that state that he didn't come out until the fight was over. Therefore, um, therefore, there is no there is no argument that can be made that he did see a fight, and therefore there's no there's no falsification at all, unsworn or otherwise. And there's no entering at all because he's seeking merely told the truth. Um, furthermore, I'd like to point out just in closing, there's no affirmative duty to help a police investigation. Um, Mr. Hodgson is, is free not to not to answer questions if he so chooses to charge him with a crime that's a violation of his rights. That's all I have. I'm sorry, charge him with a crime is what? A violation of his rights. Well, there is no duty and actually, Mr. Hodgson does have a duty to help the place. That's why Nicholas was called that night as the owner of a bar. You're I'm sorry, Jim, I'm fading. Sorry, yeah. As the owner of a bar, he does have an affirmative duty to uh, cooperate with the police in an investigation into an incident in his bar. And that's why liquor came down that night, because when they were notified that Mr. Hodgson, the defendant, was not cooperating with the police investigation, they became concerned. He absolutely has an affirmative duty as the owner of a bar to cooperate with that investigation. But... In addition, as a citizen, no, you don't, you don't have to help the police, but you can't lie. And that's what unsworn falsification prevents you on. If you don't want to talk, don't talk, unless you've been subpoenaed or some other reason. Or you're the owner of a bar and you have to talk. But if you do talk, you have to tell the truth, and you have to write a written statement that reflects the truth. And what the state's argument is, and I believe we've met our burden, that that night the defendant knew very well what went on, um, Again, Your Honor, it's essentially a circumstantial case, but you have Peter P. Escanero testifying that the defendant told him to leave. Uh, Peter P. Escanero was a suspect in that fight. Um, you have John Green saying that he saw the defendant on the porch, um, that he subsequently asked the defendant to call the police, and the defendant refused to do that. Uh, the witnesses that were in the bar that the defense called, not all of them said, that they, the defendant did not go out on the porch. Most of them said they don't know, they didn't see him, that they were busy doing their own things. Um, the Mary Ellen Montplaisir did say that the defendant was at the bar uh, behind her as she went out onto the porch, but when he got there, she doesn't know. The other witnesses didn't know. They weren't paying attention to him. They had no idea when he got out there or if he got out there. One of the witnesses even said he didn't, you know, was significantly before the altercation that he last saw the defendant, the defendant sitting in a chair. The uh, individual who testified last before Officer Sergeant Peterson, uh, I'm sorry, Ronnie, the Dutch name, Vander Stephen something. Um, no, sorry, Your Honor. That wasn't him. It was Joshua. Said that um, he went right out into the porch, never has no idea what happened with the defendant. Didn't know where he was, what he saw, or anything else. Um, but the all of those individuals were at the bar that night. Jonathan Green, the, the victim in this matter, outside, said unequivocally he made eye contact with the defendant. I can't imagine his motive to lie. Uh, he has no motive to lie. He's been caught in the middle of a fight. He's asking for help. He's looking at the defendant specifically, asking to call the police, and he doesn't do that. Um, and I take great issue with um, the, the testimony, the statement on the record of the credibility of the officer's witnesses. First of all, I, I, it's not appropriate argument um, to come on, comment on that. But secondly, uh, Sergeant Peterson explained, Sergeant Kelly explained. I didn't understand what you mean. It's not appropriate to argue in a closing about the credibility of witnesses. You can make, for him to say, I don't believe that the witness is credible, is not appropriate closing argument. I didn't object, Your Honor, we're not in front of a jury, but 
or I do object. And I don't think that that can be used at all in terms of um, assessing this case. You can decide for the Of course you are. But as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, the comment on the credibility of a witness in closing argument is completely inappropriate, more than inappropriate. And if I had done it, I that's that's a problem. Um, but there is no other testimony other than Sergeant Kelly and Sergeant Peterson in which what happens with INC is no matter why you go into that report, and I wish it wasn't this way, Your Honor, it comes up modified. If you go view that report, if you want to print the report, if I want to print it today, it will come a modified CIB. That's the testimony of these officers. And there's no contrary evidence. There has been no evidence that Officer Malplasia was not working. There's a dispatch log that apparently showed, which was not entered into evidence, but it shows that apparently, and I didn't see it, Your Honor didn't see it, that uh, Officer Malplasia was not working, according to dispatch. Does that mean he was not at the police department physically typing that report? I don't know how that follows. There's been no testimony from Officer Malplasia at all, who was here, by the way, that he did not type that report. All we have is an assertion based on some log that nobody saw that Officer Malplasia wasn't working. And we have no idea how that log was generated, where it came from, is it complete, anything. There was no testimony to that. So uh, I take great exception to the, the questioning of those officers' credibility, especially since in light of their testimony, it's very obvious why it comes off modified. Um, I believe the state has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt and uh, if I mentioned sure the guilty. Thank you. Mr. Hodge, did you just Mr. Hodge, did you clear in this case? The court's decision in this case is not grounded so much in credibility of the witnesses, but more on sufficiency of the evidence. Based upon the evidence at this point in time, the court has to be convinced, convinced to be on a reasonable doubt that he's committed charge offenses. The court has a doubt that the court considers reasonable. The court therefore has a duty to determine the court not guilty. The court finds you not guilty on all three charges. Do you understand the court's decision? Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. The court will take just a brief recess at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. All rise.